Hey everyone, it's David from Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. Wow, look at all that snow, folks. We got about 12 inches the other night, and that's going to make my trips to the dome a little more challenging. And I guess that's the price I pay for a semi-remote observatory. And believe me, I'm not complaining. This actually can be quite beautiful, and I am definitely a four-season type of guy. Um, growing up in the Northeast, I, I think, does that to you. Of course, this will impact my ability to image, but luckily I did manage to get first light with my AT-115 EDT telescope, which was just put into rotation in the dome at the start of January. And let me say, this is a wonderful instrument, especially for its price point. And clearly from the engagement that I'm seeing in the, in, in these last couple of videos, there's a lot of interest in this, in this triplet. And so just a reminder, I've started a playlist for this rig, which of course features the AT-115 EDT, uh, and an imaging train that's based on the Z, uh, ZWOASI 2600 monochrome pro camera. I'm using a two inch filter wheel and the ZWO electronic auto focuser. So there's a link in the description below to that playlist. And if you're interested in this rig or astronomy in general and all things astrophotography, go ahead, subscribe. I think you're going to like the channel as well as the community that's starting to grow here. Now, I ended my last video by showing a couple of sub-exposures and a couple of stacks for two different targets in the Gemini constellation. Now, I didn't name those targets, but I'm sure a few of you, you know, figured them out on your own. Well, I've had a chance to finish some rough LRGB processing on one of those targets, which you see here, and of course is M35. And it's just a beautiful young open star cluster near the feet of the Gemini twins. So let's take a look at that image um, and tour the neighborhood around M35. And as we do, we'll judge how well or poorly I prepared this rig and if I made the right choices for the first light sequence. Spoiler alert, I, I love the result, even though there's always room for improvement in any image that, that, that we take. I don't care. I love this image. And it tells the story that I want to tell as a photographer. And, and that's what we do here. Whether it's an astro photo or a regular photo, we're, we're, this is about sharing what we see and what we appreciate with our friends, our family, and others. And I certainly hope you guys like this uh, image as much as I do. But before we pan and zoom around, let's start with the tech stuff. Okay, so there are three areas that I had concerns about, you know, this is a brand new rig, meaning every piece of equipment other than the guide scope that I used in this rig was new to me and it's new in my observatory. The biggest concerns for me were, were back focus, um, uh, general focus and an exposure settings for, for the camera. And so starting with back focus, the published back focus requirement for the Astrotech.8 uh, reducer flattener is 55 millimeters. And, you know, I achieved that through a combination of, of accessories and extension tubes. Now, if I would have been off, say short in my, in my implementation, um, I would have expect to, I would expect to see curvature at the edges of the frame that looks something like this. This is an undercorrection, and the stars at the edge of the field seem to radiate outwards. If I would have been long on my back focus, I would expect the curvature at the edges to look more like this. Okay, in this case, we've overcorrected, and the stars at the edge of the field seem to rotate around the center of the image. So the topic of back focus I've covered in a prior video, and I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. Now, let's take a look at the edge of one of the sub-exposures uh, and, and check for either of these phenomenon. and it looks like we did okay there. But when I look at some of the subs, I definitely did not achieve pinpoint stars. Now the focus issue is entirely on me. Uh, this is not an issue uh, with the equipment itself. Uh, if you recall in the last video, uh, when I was 
uh, uh, testing first light, of course we had Polaris, and clearly we split Polaris A and B, very pinpoint stars, two second exposures. Um, but what you can see here uh, from this log of the autofocus algorithm, there is backlash that exists here that is unresolved in the configuration. And this is a and it, this is on me in that I I need to spend a few uh, um, you know a few minutes dialing this in so that we don't have this backlash. Now what happens is that if if you don't correct for the backlash in the Nina configuration, then um, it will go through his autofocus routine. It'll determine what the optimal point of focus is, where where the focuser should be, what step the focuser should be. Uh, at it'll then go to that location at the end of the routine and unfortunately if there's backlash in the system uh, the point that it goes to may not be uh, where it actually calculated focus uh, to be at and that's because the backlash is not considered properly so okay so there are things that we can do uh, clearly to improve focus i'm not i'm not at all concerned about that we'll we'll dial that in we'll get we'll get the proper uh, uh, backlash settings and 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 auto focus step size my final concern was uh, my exposure settings Gemini is a constellation with just a few famous DSOs in it, and I think there's only one Messier object. But it, for me, remains um, an interesting constellation, particularly because of some of the star clusters that you'll find in Gemini. And this first composition of M35 is all about stars, individual stars, as well as clusters of, di of different sizes, distances, ages, and color profiles. So I wanted to expose the frames long enough to capture star density everywhere on the frame. So in fact, you know, when we look at the uh, final image here, there's over 20,000 stars detectable in this image. And when I shared this with a, a friend, um, he, he said it was amazing. He had never seen so many stars at once. And that was the exact reaction I was hoping, hoping for. And it led to a, a, a real interesting dialogue around the life cycle of stars, the size of our galaxy, the age of the universe, and just how infinite and humbling, you know, it can be. Okay. So I shot four filters here. I shot IRUV for 30 seconds. And then I shot the RGB filters at 120 seconds. And this is obviously per per sub frame. And I took 20 of each. So why don't we take a look at a, a you know sample subs for each of the filters and let's look at the fits data and see how these settings translated. For each sub, we want to take a look at the histogram, make sure that the offset is preventing any clipping of the background noise, and also make sure that the average ADUs is greater than 600 or so ADUs. As we can see across each of the filters, we, we exceeded that, perhaps a little bit too much, uh, which means that I, I, I could have reduced the exposure times on uh, these subs and these filters. And uh, that's, that's something to experiment uh, with similar targets in the future. Okay, so objectively speaking, I think we nailed the back focus. I think we have some remaining steps to fine tune the electronic autofocuser in Nina. And I bet that we can adjust just a bit our exposure times using a gain of zero and an offset of 50. And uh, we're gonna try that in, in subsequent imaging sessions. In the meantime, let's dive into this image. Okay, central to this image obviously is uh, M35. And M35 is an open star cluster. It's about 3,000 light years away. And it was discovered way back in 1745. And it appears uh, to occupy an area about the size of the moon. So if, if you can imagine, you know, that, that, you know, looking up into the night sky, if you see the moon, a full moon, that's about the area that, that this star cluster occupies. And you can find it with binoculars near the feet of the, uh, of Gemini, which is which is west in in that constellation, it's all the way west in that constellation, and uh, there are a few hundred stars in this in this young cluster, and the, and the diameter of the cluster is around twenty two light years. It's a baby. It's only around one hundred fifteen million years old. 
And it's made up mostly of very hot main sequence stars, these blue stars, with a few orange and yellow giants in there to, you know, give a little contrast. And, you know, I think it's gorgeous. Amazingly, if we had a little bit southwest of, of M35 proper, you know, we'll, we'll find another open star cluster called NGC 2158. Now, this is much older and much more compact. And this cluster is about, you know, call it 12 to 15,000 light years away. So, you know, it's, it's, it's easily five times the distance uh, of, of M35. And this star cluster is super old. It's 2 billion years old. And it was discovered in 1784, uh, so roughly 40 years after M35 by William Herschel. And this is so dense, it, 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 you know, it can actually, <laughs> you, you might mistake in it for a globular or, you know, galactic cluster. In fact, there was a period of time where it was classified as a globular, but it isn't. You know, a globular cluster, these are very dense, you know, packed old stars, are usually well above or below the galactic plane. And we call that the galactic halo. And open clusters like NGC 2158 are are in the plane, the galactic plane, or the thin disk, we would call them. So, so at any rate, very interesting contrast between these two open star clusters. If we go even a little further south and west, we see an IC2157, which is another small open cluster that wasn't officially discovered or at least named until 1899. Now, this cluster gets very little love, and I guess it's you know simply considered unremarkable. But at least it gets annotated because if you go, if you if you look a little, you'll see I see 2156, which doesn't even get annotated in this image, which is just a very similar small open cluster. So what I like about this image is just the sheer number of stars in it, not just the, you know, the clusters. In fact, if we take a, let's take a look at a single star here, which is the brightest star in the frame, and it's called uh, 5 Geminorum. This is a magnitude 5.8 star and it's classified as a hypergiant. It's about 750 um, uh, light years away. And, um, you know, just a phenomenal, phenomenal to see all the different types of stars that, that, that exist in this frame. And, and you can, you, you can literally spend, if you were patient and you were interested enough, you could, you could easily spend an hour going through this image and finding very, very interesting star chains and um, examples of stars at different points in their life cycle, different colors, different sizes, um, double stars. You know, it's just a it's just a wonderful picture. And, and, and you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it's an excellent photograph and a very good first light production for for the AT-115 EDT. Okay, let's call that a wrap on the video. I hope you enjoyed the image of M35, and I certainly had a really good time uh, capturing it and processing that data. And uh, for those of you who own an AT-115 EDT, Congratulations. This is really a fine telescope at, you know, especially at its price point. And I'm looking forward to working with this rig, sharing my experiences, sharing my images over the next, say, 12 weeks while I have it in rotation. And, um, and if you haven't already done so, go ahead, subscribe. If you subscribe, you'll get notified as soon as I publish videos. And that seems to be once or twice a week at this point. So at any rate, thanks so much for watching. Thank you for your comments. And I will see you on the next video. Mm -hmm.